The namesake by Champa Lahiri, Chapter 1, 1968 On a sticky August evening, two weeks before her due date, Ashima Ganguly stands in the kitchen of a central square apartment, combining rice krispies and planters peanuts and chopped red onion in a bowl. She adds salt, lemon juice, thin slices of green chili, pepper, wishing uh, there were mustard oil to pour into the mix. Ashima has been consuming this concoction throughout her pregnancy, a humble approximation of the snack sold for pennies on Calcutta sidewalks and on railway platforms throughout India, spilling from newspaper cones. Even now, that there is a barely space inside her, it is the one thing she craves. Tasting from a cupped palm, she frowns as usual, there's something missing. She stares blankly at the pegboard behind the countertop where her cooking utensils hang, all slightly coated with grease. She wipes sweat from her face with the free end of her sari. Her swollen feet ache against speckled grey linoleum. Her pelvis aches from the baby's weight. She opens a cupboard, the shelves lined with a grimy yellow and white checkered paper she's been meaning to replace, and reaches for another onion. Frowning again as she pulls at its crisp magenta skin, a curious warmth floods her abdomen, followed by a tightening of so severe she doubles over, gasping without sound, dropping the onion with a thud on the floor. The sensation passes, only to be followed by a more enduring spasm of discomfort. In the bathroom, she discovers, on her underpants, a solid streak of brownish blood. She calls out to her husband, Ashok, a doctoral candidate in the electrical engineering at MIT, who is studying in the bedroom. He leans over a card table, the edge of their bed, two twin mattresses pushed together under red and purple batik spread, serves as his chair. When she calls out to Ashok, she doesn't say his name. Ashima never thinks of her husband's name when she thinks of her husband, even though she knows perfectly well what it is. She has adopted his surname, but refuses, for propriety's sake, to utter his first. It's not the type of thing Bengali wives do. Like a kiss or a caress in a Hindi movie, a husband's name is something intimate and therefore unspoken cleverly patched over. And so, instead of saying Ashok's name, she utters the interrogative that has come to replace it, which translates roughly as, Are you listening to me? At dawn, a taxi is called to ferry them through the deserted Cambridge streets up Massachusetts Avenue and past Harvard Yard to Mount Auburn Hospital. Ashima registers, answering questions about the frequency and duration of the contractions as Ashok fills out the forms. She is seated in a wheelchair and pushed through the shining, brightly lit corridors, whisked into an elevator more spacious than her kitchen. On the maternity floor, she is assigned to a bed by a window in a room at the end of the hall. She is asked to remove her Murshidabad silk sari in favor of a flowered cotton gown that, to her mild embarrassment, only reaches to her knees. A nurse offers to fold up the sari, but Exasperated by the six slippery yards, she ends up stuffing 
the material into Ashima's slate blue suitcase. Her obstetrician, Dr. Ashley, gaunt, gauntly handsome in a Lord Mountbatten sort of way, with fine sand-colored hair swept back from his temples, arrives to examine her progress. The baby's head is in the proper position, has already begun its descent. She is told that she is still in early labor, three centimeters dilated, beginning to efface. What does it mean, dilated, she asks, and Dr. Ashley holds up two fingers side by side, then draws them apart, explaining the unimaginable thing her body must do in order for the baby to pass. The process will take some time. Dr. Ashley tells her, given that this is her first pregnancy, labor can take 24 hours, sometimes more. She searches for Ashok's face, but he has stepped behind the curtain the doctor has drawn. I'll be back, Ashok says to her in Bengali. And then a nurse adds, don't worry, Mr. Ganguly, she's got a lot long ways to go. We can take over from here. Now she is alone, cut off by curtains from the three other women in the room. One woman's name she gathers from bits of conversation is Beverly. Another is Louis. Carol lies to her left. God damn it. God damn you. This is hell, she hears one of them say. And then a man's voice. I love you, sweetheart. Words Ashima has neither heard nor expects to hear from her own husband. This is not how they are. It is the first time in her life she has slept alone, surrounded by strangers. All her life, she has slept either in a room with her parents or with Ashok at her side. She wishes the curtains were open so that she could talk to the American woman. Perhaps one of them has given birth before, can tell her what to expect. But she has gathered that Americans, in spite of their public de declarations of affection, in spite of their mini skirts and bikinis, in spite of their hand holding on the street and lying on top of each other on the Cambridge Common, prefer their privacy. She spreads her fingers over the taut, enormous drum her middle has become, wondering where the baby's feet and hands are at this moment. The child is no longer restless. For the past few days, apart from the occasional flutter, she has not felt it punch or kick or press against her ribs. She wonders if she is the only Indian person in the hospital, but a gentle twitch from the baby reminds her that she is, technically speaking, not alone. Ashima thinks it's strange that her child will be born in a place most people enter either to suffer or to die. There is nothing to comfort her in the off-white tiles of the floor, the off-white panels of the ceiling, the white sheets tucked tightly into the bed. In India, she thinks to herself, Women go home to their parents to give birth, away from husbands and in-laws and household cares, retreating briefly to childhood when the baby arrives. Another contraction begins, more violent than the last. She cries out, pressing her head against the pillow. Her fingers grip the chilly rails of the bed. No one hears her. No nurse rushes to her side. She has been instructed to time the duration of the contractions 
and so she consults her watch, a bond voyage gift from her parents. Slipped over her wrist the last time she saw them amid airport confusion and tears. It wasn't until she was on the plane, flying for the first time in her life on a VOAC VC-10, whose deafening ascent, 26 members of her family had watched from the balcony of Dam Dam Airport. As she was drifting over parts of India, she had never set foot in, and then even farther outside India itself, that she had noticed the watch among the cavalcade of matrimonial bracelets on both her arms, iron, gold, coral, conch. Now in addition, she wears a plastic bracelet with a typed label identifying her as a patient of the hospital. She keeps the watch face turned to the inside of her wrist. On the back, surrounded by the words waterproof, anti-magnetic and shock protected, her married initials, A, G, are inscribed. American seconds tick on top of her pulse point. For half a minute, a band of pain wraps around her stomach, radiating toward her back and shooting down her legs. And then, again, relief. She calculates the Indian time on her hands. The tip of her thumb strikes each rung of the brown ladders etched onto the backs of her fingers, then stops at the middle of the third. It is nine and a half hours ahead in Calcutta. Already evening, half past eight. In the kitchen of her parents' flat on Amherst Street, at this very moment, a servant is pouring after-dinner tea into steaming glasses arranging merry biscuits on a tray. Her mother, very soon to be a grandmother, is standing at the mirror of her dressing table, untangling waist-length hair, still more black than grey, with her fingers. Her father hunches over his slanted, ink-stained table by the window, sketching, smoking, listening to the voice of America. Her younger brother, Rana, studies for a physics exam on the bed. She pictures clearly the grey cement floor of her parents' sitting room, feels its solid chill underfoot, even on the hottest days. An enormous black and white photograph of her deceased Paternal grandfather looms at one end against the pink plaster wall. Opposite an alcove shielded by clouded panes of glass is stuffed with books and papers, her father's watercolor tints. For an instant, the weight of the baby vanishes, replaced by the scene that passes before her eyes only to be replaced once more by a blue strip of the child's liver. Thick green treetops, cars gliding up and down Memorial Drive. In Cambridge, it is 11 in the morning, already lunchtime in the hospital's accelerated day. A tray holding warm apple juice, jello, ice cream, and cold baked big uh, chicken is brought to her side. Patty, the friendly nurse with the diamond engagement ring and a fringe of reddish hair beneath her cap, tells Ashima to consume only the jello and the apple juice. It's just as well. Ashima would not have touched the chicken, even if permitted. Americans eat their chicken in its skin, though Ashima has recently found a kind butcher on Prospect Street 
willing to pull it off for her. Patty comes to fluff the pillows, tidy the bed. Dr. Ashley pokes in his head from time to time. No need to worry, he chirps, putting the stethoscope to Ashima's belly, patting her hand, admiring her various bracelets. Everything is looking perfectly normal. We are expecting a perfectly normal delivery, Miss Kanguli. But nothing feels normal to Ashima. For the past 18 months, ever since she has arrived in Cambridge, nothing has felt normal at all. It's not so much the pain, which she knows somehow she will survive. It's the consequence. Motherhood in a foreign land. For it was one thing to be pregnant, to suffer the queasy mornings in bed the sleepless nights, the dull throbbing in her back, the countless visits to the bathroom. Throughout the experience, in spite of her growing discomfort, she had been astonished by her body's ability to make life, exactly as her mother and grandmother and all her great-grandmothers had done. That it was happening so far from home, unmonitored and unobserved by those she loved, had made it more miraculous still. But she is terrified to raise a child in a country where she is related to no one, where she knows so little, where life seems so tentative and spare. How about a little walk? It might do you good. Patty asks when she comes to clear the lunch tray. Ashima looks up from a tattered copy of Desh magazine that she had brought to read on her plane ride to Boston and still cannot bring herself to throw away. The printed pages of Bengali type, slightly rough to the touch, are a perpetual comfort to her. She's read each of the short stories and poems and articles a dozen times. There is a pen and ink drawing on page 11 by her father, an illustrator for the magazine, a view of the North Calcutta skyline sketched from the roof of their flat one foggy January morning. She had stood behind her father as he had drawn it, watching as he crouched over his easel, a cigarette dangling from his lips, his shoulders wrapped in the black Kashmiri shawl. Yes, all right, Ashima says. Patty helps Ashima out of bed, tucks her feet one by one into slippers, drapes a second nightgown around her shoulders. Just think, Patty says, as Ashima struggles to stand. In a day or two, you'll be half the size. She takes Ashima's arm as they step out of the room into the hallway. After a few feet, Ashima stops her legs trembling as another wave of pain surges through her body. She shakes her head, her eyes filling with tears. I cannot. You can. Squeeze my hand. Squeeze as tight as you like. After a minute, they continue on towards the nurse's station. Hoping for a boy or a girl, Patty asks. As long as there are ten fingers and ten toe, Ashima replies. For these anatomical details, these particular signs of life are the ones she has the most difficulty picturing when she imagines the baby in her arms. Patty smiles a little too widely and suddenly Ashima realizes her error. She knows she should have said 
fingers and toes. This error explain, uh, this error pains her almost as much as her last contraction. English had been her subject. In Calcutta, before she was married, she was working toward a college degree. She used to tutor neighborhood school children in their homes, on their veranda and beds, helping them to memorize Tennyson and Woodsworth to pronounce words like sign and cuff, to understand the difference between Aristotelian and Shakespearean tragedy. But in Bengali, a finger can also mean fingers, a toe, toes. It had been after tutoring one day that Ashima's mother had met her at the door told her to go straight to the bedroom and prepare herself. A man was waiting to see her. He was the third in as many months. The first had been a widower of four children. The second, a newspaper cartoonist who knew her father, had been hit by a bus in Esplanade and lost his left arm. To her great relief, they had both rejected her. She was 19 in the middle of her studies, no rush to be a bride. And so, obediently but without expectation, she had untangled and rebraided her hair, wiped away the coal that had smudged below her eyes, patted some cuticura powder, from a velvet puff onto her skin. The sheer padded green sari she pleated and tucked into her petticoat had been laid out for her on the bed by her mother. Before entering the sitting room, Ashima had paused in the corridor. She could hear her mother saying, she is fond of cooking and she can knit extremely well. Within a week, she finished this cardigan I am wearing. Ashima smiled, amused by her mother's salesmanship. It had taken her the better part of a year to finish the cardigan. And still her mother had had to do the sleeves. Glancing at the floor where visitors customarily removed their slippers, she noticed, beside two sets of chapels, a pair of men's shoes that were not like any she had ever seen on the streets and trams and buses of Kolkata, or even in the windows of Bata. They were brown shoes with black heels and off-white laces and stitching. There was a band of lentil-sized holes embossed on either side of each shoe. And at the tips was a pretty pattern pricked into the leather as if it was a needle. Looking more closely, she saw the shoemaker's name written on the insides in gold lettering that had all but faded. Something and sons, it said. She saw the size, eight and a half, and the initials, USA. And as her mother continued to sing her praises, Ashima, unable to resist a sudden and overwhelming urge, stepped into the shoes at her feet. Lingering sweat from the owner's feet mingled with hers, causing her heart to race. It was the closest thing she had ever experienced to the touch of a man. The leather was creased, heavy, and still warm. On the left shoe, she had noticed that one of the crisscrossing laces had missed a hole and this oversight set her at ease. She extracted her feet 
entered the room. The man was sitting in a rattan chair. His parents perched on the edge of the twin bed where her brother slept at night. He was slightly plump, scholarly looking, but still youthful with black, thick framed glasses and a sharp prominent nose. A neatly trimmed moustache connected to a beard that covered only his chin lent him an elegant, vaguely aristocratic air. He wore brown socks and brown trousers and a green and white striped shirt and was staring glumly at his knees. He did not look up when she appeared, though she was aware of his gray gaze as she crossed the room. By the time she managed to steal another look at him, he was once again indifferent, focused on his knees. He cleared his throat as if to speak, but then said nothing. Instead, it was his father who did the talking, saying that the man had gone to St. Xavier's and then B.E. College, graduating first class, first from both institutions. Ashima took her seat and smoothed the pleats of her sari. She sensed the mother eyeing her with approval. Ashima was five feet four inches, tall for a Bengali woman, 99 pounds. Her complexion was on the dark side of fair, but she had been compared on more than one occasion to the actress Madhavi Mukherjee. Her nails were admirably long, her fingers, like her father's, artistically slim. They inquired after her studies, and she was asked to recite a few stanzas from the daffodils. The man's family lived in Alipur. The father was a labor officer from the customs department of a shipping company. My son has been living abroad for two years, the man's father said, earning a PhD in Boston, researching in the fields of fiber optics. Ashima had never heard of Boston or of fiber optics. She was asked whether she was willing to fly on a plane and then if she was capable of living in a city characterized by severe, snowy winters alone. Won't he be there? she asked, pointing to the man whose shoes she had briefly occupied, but who had yet to say a word to her. It was only after the betrothal that she had learned his name. One week later, the invitations were printed, and two weeks after that, she was adorned and adjusted by countless aunts, countless cousins hovering around her. These were her last moments as Ashima Bhaduri, before becoming Ashima Ganguli. Her lips were darkened, her brow and cheeks dotted with sandalwood paste, her hair wound up, bound with flowers held in place by a hundred wire pins that would take an hour to remove once the wedding was finally over. Her head was draped with scarlet knitting. The air was damp, and in spite of the pins, Ashimar's hair, Thickest of all the cousins would not lie flat. She wore all the necklaces and chokers and bracelets that were destined to live most of their lives in an extra large safety deposit box in a back vault in New England. At the designated hour, she was seated in <coughs> Thank you.
on a pity that her father had decorated, who stood five feet off the ground. He carried out to meet the groom. She had hidden her face with a heart-shaped beetle leaf, kept her head bent low until she had circled him seven times. Eight thousand miles away in Cambridge, she has come to know him. In the evenings, she cooks for him, hoping to please with the unrationed, remarkably unblemished sugar, flour, rice, and salt she had written about to her mother in her very first letter home. By now, she has learned that her husband likes his food on the salty side, that his favorite thing about lamb curry is the potatoes, and that he likes to finish his dinner with a small final helping of rice and dal. At night, lying beside her in bed, he listens to her describe the events of her day, her walks along Massachusetts Avenue, the shops she visits, the Hare Krishnas who pester her with their leaflets, the pistachio the pistachio ice cream cones she treats herself to in Harvard Square. In spite of his meager graduate student wages, he sets aside money to send every few months to his father to help put an extension on his parents' house. He is fastidious about his clothing. Their first argument had been over a sweater she had shrunk in the washing machine. As soon as he comes home from university, the first thing he does is hang up his shirt and trousers, donning a pair of drawstring pajamas and a pullover if it's cold. On Sundays, he spends an hour occupied with his tins of shoes policies and his three pairs of shoes, two black and one brown. The brown ones are the ones he had been wearing when he had first come to see her. The sight of him cross-legged on newspapers, spread on the floor, intently whisking a brush over the leather, always reminds her of, his, of her indiscretion in her parents' corridor. It is a moment that shocks her still, and that she prefers in spite of all she tells him at night about the life they now share to keep to herself.